Good morning, everybody, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. How are we all doing? All right. Great to see you all. For those who don't know me, I'm Evan. Hello. Hello out there. Uh, I'm Evan, the youth pastor here at the Home Church, and I have the privilege and honor of speaking with you yet again today. I just, I always revel in this moment because I don't get to do it a lot, but I've been getting a lot of really cool things put on my heart um, from God throughout this Christmas season, even dating back a couple months, and uh, I'm just really excited to share it with you all today. Uh, last time I was with you all, I spoke at length about my battle with anxiety, and uh, anxiety in general, and what the Bible has to say about it, and hopefully helped us realize just how powerful those patterns of thought can be in, uh, in kind of making us um, have certain impasses to growing and transforming more and more into Christ. And today I'll be switching gears a little bit and talking about basically the outward manifestation of our thought life, which is words. Specifically, the power of words. So thoughts are one thing, and I think we can all at least understand just how crippling they can be at times um, if we're stuck in those negative thought patterns. But words are especially interesting. They have that added property of not only affecting you, but affecting the world around us, right? Affecting those we come in contact with, affecting us, the words we tell ourselves. So, you know, I think everyone here can attest to a time in their life where we almost immediately regretted something we said to someone else, that gut-wrenching feeling of, ooh, where did that come from? That was not good. Um, and usually, you know, those are there, those feelings of the spirit within you saying, ooh, that wasn't too great, to let you know, hey, you know, once those words are out there, they can't be taken back. It's a very powerful thing. They can't be unsaid. Um, James, in chapter 3 of, of the book of James, he makes some very interesting um, kind of metaphors for words. Uh, the first one he uses is the, the bit in a horse's mouth, how this big, muscular animal can be directed around with just a small little instrument. And then he talks about a ship and the rudder of a ship, how tiny it is and minuscule in comparison to the whole ship, but it directs its path. And then my favorite analogy especially in thinking about all these devastating wildfires this year in California, how that one spark can set aflame a whole forest in a pretty short order. Um, words are very, very powerful. So we're going to start kind of our cornerstone for the morning in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 18.21, you can turn to it in your own Bible or you can read it up here on the screen. But it reads, Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That is a strong statement, right? But I don't think, after you know, reading through this several times in these last few weeks, I don't think this is just hyperbole, meant to kind of grab our attention in some sort of provocative way. As we'll discover throughout this morning, the writer of Proverbs, which was most likely Solomon, uh, may have meant this to be a lot more literal than we might initially think. Uh, I think it's very, I guess, easy as broken and frail humans to, uh, well, who talk, let's face it, we talk a whole lot every single day, and I think it's easy for us to underestimate the impact that every single, words, every single word can have when speaking to our parents, our loved ones, family, friends, etc., that can really speak life or death into the world around us. So interesting fact, on average, we speak around 16,000 words per day. Now, that's, that's a lot of ammunition, granted, uh, but we are all unique. That's a total average. I'm sure you know people that, maybe you're one of them, that speak uh, 25,000 or maybe 50,000 words a day. You know who you are, probably, and you're skewing that number big time, but we're just going to take the average for now. 16,000 words per day, that's still a lot of words, and I think it makes it easy for us to underestimate the impact and the significance of those words and how those can resonate with other people. So to put things in perspective, 16,000 words a day is like writing a 60-page book with your words every single day. Now, do you want that, the theme of that book to be overly uh, positive and encouraging and uplifting? Or it's very easy to make it a very negative and somber and downtrodden book, right? It's very easy for us to become, I think, careless with our words. Um, and it's why the Bible makes, uh, I think, extra effort to highlight their power and really admonishes us to take extra care with them. 
So, uh, I'm looking for a lot of parenting material lately, as you can imagine. We have, uh, my wife Lauren and I have three beautiful kids, uh, a five-year-old Mason, three-year-old Marcus, and one-year-old little Juliet. And <laughs> I just, I was randomly reading a blog, and I came across the old, I guess you could call it an old adage, think before you speak. And just, just about everyone has heard this one, and I'm sure it was told to them more than once in their childhood. Uh, but how often, I, I wonder, in adulthood, do we really take it that seriously and actually put it into practice? Uh, the acronym that this article happened to mention was to only speak if the next words were think, T-H-I-N-K. So only speak if it's true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind. Well, that's a good reminder, but is it really that easy? I don't think so. As we'll find out, it's just really not enough, at least for me in my experience, to try to will ourselves into thinking before we speak and use that as the sole means of transformation. It just doesn't work, at least in my experience. So we'll be looking at ways to kind of go deeper with that this morning. So one group of people that has always kind of impressed me and intrigued me that really takes the power of words seriously are monks. I'm sure you all kind of have this image in your mind right when I say that of some guy with a big brown robe and like a friar tuck haircut with a, the rope around their waist. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've all kind of heard of how they take on vows of silence at times, or at least kind of periods of the day, day devoted to silence as a means to limit their chance of maybe messing up with words and therefore drawing closer to God. Uh, granted, they're usually in pretty idyllic settings, right, on the top of a mountain, cloistered away, um, really focusing on their relationship with God. But those practices have survived and thrived throughout the centuries because they work, because of their effectiveness. Because really striving to honor God with our words, it's hard work and it's a cost of being a Christian. And, uh, but it does pay us back as, as you know, giving us a pathway to be more connected with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and with God. Um, you know, and saying that, I also acknowledge that we all can't be monks. That's ridiculous. We would not, you know, that's a horrible idea. Don't go off and be a monk. I'm not saying that. I'm just bringing it up to give you an idea. I mean, we all have various busy lives to lead, especially in this valley filled with parenting and PTA meetings and football games and um, office interactions, etc. And I was just chuckling with Lauren about this last night. Um, I, I just would love if one of these monks would come down the hill one time and just live in my shoes for one day. I think it would just be hilarious. I could just, I, I really just start busting up at the thought of one of them taking my three kids to Costco on a Saturday afternoon. I, I don't think they'd last an hour. It would be a, a nightmare. Um, in fact, if anyone's looking for like a million dollar reality TV show idea, that's it right there. Monks coming to the real world. You could call it like monks in the valley. They'd be like, all right, this guy's, Brother Lawrence is going to go with the Smiths this week, and you're going to be cooking breakfast while the baby's throwing food at you. It'd be great. I think if anyone wants to pitch that in L.A., you, you got it. You have my blessing. <laughs> so um, the question really is, I think, as people who live in this valley and have a tremendous amount of responsibility and activity, how do we let the Holy Spirit really guide us in slowing down and staying in the present moment and truly think before we speak? Well, there's one thing I know because I've tried it and it doesn't work. I, I just, I cannot do it in my own power alone. I desperately need the Holy Spirit bringing me more and more into self-awareness and more and more into understanding the power of my words. So I'm someone who loves humor and a good laugh, and I think humor is probably one of the greatest gifts that God has given us to, um, you know, it's just a fantastic tool to draw people together, to create levity throughout our lives, but it's also a very dangerous tool, especially when used in maybe uh, a too sarcastic or cutting way, and uh, I'm sure some of you are the same way in here, but it's really hard at times to let opportunities go by when someone maybe misspeaks or sets themselves up for a well-timed joke, but oftentimes the damage it can do heavily outweighs the short-term benefits. And over the years, I've kind of learned to reel that back in and ask myself, why am I doing this? You know, wh what is the motivation here? Why, why do I maybe feel a compulsion to fill that void with some sort of well-timed quip or joke? Um, is it really for the benefit of others, or am I just trying to bring praise and favor to myself? 
Uh, you know, maybe there is some sort of void underneath everything that I'm trying to compensate for and have some real introspection around that. Uh, if, that's, if that's you maybe today or you've struggled with that in the past, something that I've used is, is you know, thinking about, you know, who am I really honoring with these words? What is, my, what is my intention here? Why am I saying these things? Because you see, for me, I guess, especially in this season of my life, it's very, very easy to be reactive. Uh, kids have that knack of just being able to push your buttons, and you want to fix it right away and respond right away. Um, as I was caught up yet again in shouting over my five-year-old Mason, Lauren's laughing at me, um, I, just, I, I kind of was wondering in real time, what in the world is happening to me? <laughs> what is going on? Why do I feel this knee-jerk reaction to kind of respond right away and not just take a pause and think and take a step back? Is there any reason why I can't when I'm feeling these emotions bubble up out of control and really ask, is this going to be true? Is this going to be helpful and inspiring and kind? Or more importantly, like I was saying, why did I just say that? And where is that coming from? I think those are very important questions to ask. So I think we can all agree that words have tremendous power. And we know this to be true because I bet everyone in here can speak to a time in their life when just a few words maybe spoken to them uh, had the power of really life and death in them. They either crushed you or lifted you up. Maybe they were spoken to you by a parent or a friend or a sibling or a colleague or a teacher or a coach. And they really had the power to either lift you up and really motivate you to push forward and, and live for Christ, or they sent you into a downward spiral. And maybe even they've said to you in your formative years became the spark that started to form who you really, or what you really believe about yourself. So my dad grew up with a dad that, I've been trying to think of how to say this, is very, <laughs> or was very, um, uh, not very nurturing, and extremely, I guess, uncareful with his words at times. And my dad told me a story several years back of a time when they were all at the dinner table. My dad had just got back from a baseball game. I think he was early teens or maybe 11, 12, something like that. And my dad's played the sport his whole life. He's a great baseball player, loves the sport. And he sits down, and, and his dad turns to him and says, hey, Barry, how'd you do at the game today? And my dad excitedly wants to share with him and says, oh, I did, I did great, Dad. I, I actually went two for four, had a double, two RBIs. And his dad just turned to him and said, ah, you can't hit, and then proceeded to gnaw on his food. So imagine what kind of damage that would do to the psyche of a child who really is just, you know, trying to prove himself to his father and do the best he can. Um, it, it really, you know, it, but it's something that really makes me so proud of the dad that my father became. Um, I've been trying to think of how to like process and say this as well, but he always strived to do it differently. It's very easy to perpetuate that cycle of somewhat verbal abuse almost and just really being critical and cutting to your kids. But he always strived to do it differently. Uh, one thing that always just impressed me about my dad was his, um, I actually vividly remember him telling me uh, one day after, when I kind of, I think I was coming home from practice or something, but he said, never feel bad about asking me to take you out and play catch or or hit or whatever after school or work, that that was our time, that that was time that I am devoted to being with you and being intentional about loving you and taking time with you. And he did that for my sister and I, and it was just an incredible encouragement and his way of just continually building us up and lifting us up through words. He was a master at speaking that truth in love. Granted, he would definitely correctly or tactfully correct us if need be. He was very good at that too, but man, was it night and day from what I saw from my grandpa. And that, that's just a testament to God's work in him. Then there are those in our congregation even. I, just this morning, uh, I wasn't really thinking about it, I was, uh, but um, I, I'm just blown away by you guys. I love you all so much. And you know, some of the main reasons that Lauren and I kept investing more and more in wanting to come back was because of the words that were shared to us from some of the congregants here that we now love so much. 
Uh, specifically, I think of Papa Jay, Jay Tor. Uh, brother, I'd just like to say that you are an inspiration to me. Um, your words of affirmation and your, your encouragement to me and Lauren have just been an absolute blessing. I, I just love you to death. He, he's just always speaking light and life into the congregation here at this church. Um, yeah, amen, seriously. Can I get a hug? I need a hug, Jay. Seriously. I love this man. Sorry, I just, I got overwhelmed. I had to do it. I hope my mic still works. There we go, okay. So, Jay, um, I just can't thank you enough, especially with your encouragement to always cherish my wife and kids. That's just a constant thing, a theme that you brought up every single time I come through these doors. He holds my face, and <laughs> I love that, and he'll pray over me. He's a man that, he's a man of action. He won't just say, I love you, and I'm praying for you. He will say, hey, I'm going to pray for you right now, and use those words of power that God has blessed him with to pray over someone. So thank you, Jay. Um, okay, wow, I just totally got lost. All right, <laughs> enough of the mushy stuff. Let's get to scripture. <laughs> that sounded bad, but okay. We're going to go to, uh, next we're going to go to Matthew. There we go. So Matthew 12, 34 to 37. Um, here Jesus is addressing the Pharisees, uh, which I, I always love when he addresses the Pharisees. It's just really good stuff. Uh, they've just accused him yet again this time of... Um, getting his power from Satan when casting a demon out of man. And uh, I love Jesus for his boldness. He's just, he's anything but meek and mild. And, you know, he's just always uh, addressing confrontation head on and just speaking truth into the situation. So he says, you brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil pers person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on Judgment Day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. So I think it's interesting here, and it really hit me as pretty profound this week, that Jesus goes deeper here, explaining that words aren't really the disease, they're just the symptom. Our words are revealing, in a sense, our current heart condition. For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. Another version says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So Jay's heart is for the people of this church. Jay's heart is for me. And those words of love and affirmation are simply an outflow of his heart condition. My dad's heart was for us, his children. He loved us so much that he was willing to put in the time to encourage us with his words, and, and action, those actions were simply an overflow of his heart condition for us. And he also knew that forming that kind of a bond couldn't just be turned on and off, but really needed to be nurtured and consistently backed up. And he made, to, he made sure to stress that, no matter what, hey, I am here for you. And he would say it, and that, that's really important because he and not only said it, but very very intentionally, consistently backed it up. So this verse really kind of turned a light on for me because you see, it's not as easy as just watching what I say or thinking before I speak. It's deeper than that. Matthew's telling us that words are simply an outward manifestation of our current heart condition. And in order to start consistently glorifying God with our words, we first have to do the hard work of transforming our hearts to be aligned with Christ. And there's really no quick fix or psychological trick for that. So if true transformation is our goal, which I think it all is here at the home church, then fighting against those symptoms of speaking words that are unglorifying to God just in our own power is simply not enough. It's never going to be enough. To reach and really cure that underlying disease requires a lot of patience and vulnerability before God allowing him to slowly but surely work on our hearts. It also requires us to make a really intentional choice about how we are going to conduct our lives with our words from this point forward. Are you going to walk that noble but very difficult path of speaking the truth in love no matter what? Or 
you know, it's easier for humans to kind of devolve into that chaos of speaking falsely and lying and being critical and cruel with our words. Okay, let's circle back. We're going to go now all the way back to the beginning, beginning of the story, very, very beginning, uh, in Genesis 1. So we see here a very interesting thing that we're going to parallel to the New Testament. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, totally void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and morning were the first day. So there was nothing. There was a total void. And God, through that, said, he projected out his voice, not thought, not just moved or kind of pointed, but he said his tool for creating the universe that we currently inhabit was words. And we see this throughout the creation account. He kind of speaks and then it manifests. And there's a pattern of God um, creating through words and then calling or identifying it. Now the serpent, that wily serpent, comes along um, in chapter 3 and uses his own words to kind of undermine God's words and bring death to where there was life. He introduces that chaos into the world through his lying and deception. And the serpent's words were definitely not true, but that didn't keep them from having power, right? So the moment Adam and Eve spoke those words in their own hearts and really believed the lie, it gave power to that lie. And this principle kind of seems hardwired into the universe in a way. In reality, uh, you know, especially in relation to the lies we tell ourselves, someone might say, oh, you can't do this or that. But those words really only take hold and have true power over you when you believe them to be true. When you lose sight, I guess, of your true nature, your true identity in Christ, that real foundation. Even secular science and sports psychologists know this to be undeniably true, that practice of like self-talk or pumping yourself up before a big game or performance uh, with positive kind of verbal affirmations. Uh, it's been known for years now to be objectively successful in whatever you're going to go into, whatever endeavor. And on the flip side, that negative self-talk of, uh, for instance, like saying, oh man, I just can't hit a shot today if you're playing basketball, or man, I feel slow today before going into a track meet, seem to be self-fulfilling in the way they kind of change our thought patterns and therefore performance on the fly. So let's head over to the New Testament now and let's try to find some parallels to what just happened there in the creation account. Uh, we'll be going to the Gospel of John because, uh, well, unlike the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who all kind of have a similar style of, and, and pattern of telling the story of Jesus Christ, John uses a very different method of introducing us to Jesus. Um, I'm sure all of you, most of you might know where I'm headed, but how does he introduce Jesus? What does he call him? The Word. Yes, Tim. So we're going to go to John 1, 1 through 5, one of my favorites. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. The Word was with God in the beginning, and all things were created by him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines on in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. So we have this interesting parallel of, in Genesis, God speaks light into darkness. And in John 1, we see Jesus is introduced as the word that comes kind of bringing light into darkness yet again in human form. The logos, or the Greek word for word uh, here, which means kind of the expression or declaration of a thought, or philosophically kind of as that articulated truth that comes into chaos. And you see this throughout his ministry. Christ was constantly using words to speak the kingdom of heaven and truth and light into this world. In John 8, 31 to 32, we have Jesus speaking to some Jews that had believed him, and he says... If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How powerful is that promise, church? I mean, you abide in him, you know the truth, and that, will set, that is your course for freedom. 
to know that truth that you are born again in Christ and nothing can take that away. No scheme of the evil one can take that away. How freeing that truth is. Uh, two other scriptures that kind of came to mind in the Gospels as I was putting this together. Uh, Mark 138. So Jesus replies, Let us go somewhere else to nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. That is why he came. And then Luke 4, 18 through 19. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So that was his mission. That is why he came. He, he came to bring truth into chaos, to speak light and truth into this world, and obviously to give us that opportunity, that precious inheritance that is ours to take, um, to be reconciled with God through him. I was reminded last week of another couple instances where words were kind of used over other mediums in Jesus' ministry on earth. Uh, for instance, how did Jesus calm the storm on the boat with his disciples or bring Lazarus forth out of the grave? He used words. If you remember on, in the story with his disciples on the boat, as this storm is raging, he literally just says to the waves and rebukes them, saying, quiet, be still, to the waves. And in the same way with Lazarus, bringing him from death to life, says, Lazarus, come forth. So this study has really kind of given me pause and um, allowed me to process and think about the power of words at maybe a deeper level than I, that I have in the past. I just think it's interesting that, you know, if God the Father and Jesus Christ's main tool for bringing light into darkness and life instead of death was words, how seriously should I be kind of auditing and, and taking our speech to others and ourselves more carefully, right? I mean, it's an amazing gift to be blessed with that power of speech and verbal communication. We're unlike anything else on the planet in that way. Uh, there was intention in that design. I mean, he could have created humanity without that capacity or with telepathy or something else weird, <laughs> but he intended us to use words in this fallen world to bring glory to him, to lift people up, to speak light and life into this world, like Jay, like my father, like many of you here. So in our youth group, we recently went through a kind of workshop to develop what we call our true identity statement. Uh, it's a process that combines several truths. Uh, just as an example, here's a few. The, the finished work of Christ in you, which instills safety. The truth of who you are in Christ, which instills security. It even brings in the meaning of your name, an accompanying scripture verse, uh, your talents and strengths, and a few other elements to develop basically a, a statement, a coherent statement that's based in truth that you can read out loud to yourself to ground you in the truth that you are a child of God with a grand inheritance. I know I was very blessed by it and the youth that attended, and it's been somewhat of a cornerstone for me. It's not just for youth. I mean, anyone can do this. I actually I have the materials. If anyone cares to go through it themselves, I'd be more than happy to share that with you. But it's really been a fantastic daily reminder for me to put on that firm foundation first of who I am in Christ um, and who God sees me as. And that's the foundation. And everything else, all my circumstances and different situations in life that revolve around that really needs to be sh kind of shown through that light first. So another example of how words have brought light and life to my current life season has been speaking blessings over my wife and kids. Um, proclaiming the truth of Christ's love and provision over their life has really been something very special to me. And I, I bought this wonderful blessing book. It's uh, Blessing Your Children from the Ortliebs, who run our married people ministry here at the home church. And um, they're awesome, and they've really been uh, very intentional about setting up time to even work on this stuff at the married people group. And uh, it's just been really interesting. At first I thought, um, I'll give it a shot. I wasn't really expecting much, but it's been interesting to see how it's really changed my heart and how speaking those blessings over my kids, over Lauren, and receiving them has been much more maybe impactful 
and has some sort of a different resonance than maybe just getting prayed for or saying, hey, I'll pray for you, obviously, or something like that. There's just really power in laying hands on someone and blessing them. And uh, so I wanted to share this. That's my beautiful Juliet. Uh, she was much younger there. Now she's uh, like 15 months old and walking around. But um, so this is just, uh, it's an ongoing battle for me. As I was speaking last time, I was talking about anxiety and how riddled with it I can be at times and how I constantly need to shed that off of myself and lay it at the foot of Christ. And having a girl now, I have those two crazy boys who I love to death, but there's something extra special. I don't know what it is about having this girl, but with that comes a lot more anxiety, I guess, and concern and constantly just never wanting anything bad to happen to her and treating her like just a gem. Um, so I, I found this blessing to be actually probably more therapeutic for me than it is for her. <laughs> this is just something that's like very helpful for me right now. But um, it, the prayer goes, in the name of Jesus Christ, I bless you with the confidence that you can lie down in peace and sleep. Although she still wakes up throughout the night, Lauren knows about that. She gets up, not me. <laughs> um, for though you are alone, the Lord your God will keep you safe. He will let you rest in the meadow grass beside the quiet stream. You can call on the name of the Lord when you are in danger and he will keep you safe. If you put your trust in God and not in men, he will put a hedge of protection around you. And when doing right, you will not be afraid, but will always rest in peace and safety. And it comes with scripture verse to kind of back up that truth within the blessing. Um, but yeah, just also praying over her for, you know, her friends that she's going to make in the future, her husband that she'll meet in the future, which is terrifying. But stu stuff like that, um, they're just powerful to be able to speak that, actually not just kind of pray it in your mind, but speak that out over your children. So uh, here's my, I guess, challenge for the week. I'd like us to kind of experiment with the power of words, to kind of transform us more and more into that image of Christ that we're striving after. Uh, some ways that I've been experimenting with myself that you can try out on your own are to speak scripture out loud during your time in the word, not just to kind of go through your time in the word, go through the kind of motions, but try actually speaking it out loud. When you're reading a passage in John or wherever else, speak it out loud to yourself. You know, let that uh, bounce off the walls and have kind of a different feeling and resonance to it. I think there is power in that. Um, and then in, in the, at the same time, speaking your prayers out loud to God during your prayer time alone. It's very easy for me to just get in the rut of kind of thinking in my mind while I'm driving or whatever, but try speaking that out loud and kind of see what kind of extra added power that has to it. Um, and then also speaking the truth and love to your friends and family and even strangers. I know, you know, uh, evangelizing for some people makes you kind of curl up in a ball and think, oh my goodness, I can't do that. What are you talking about? I don't speak to strangers. Maybe about football scores or something, but not God. That's crazy. Like, what? especially for men, right? I mean, it's very easy for us to kind of, like a lot of our friendships, let's face it, are very surface level. It's like, oh, let's see, I've talked about sports. What else can I talk about? Uh, I don't want him to get too deep here. This is getting weird. So, you know, speaking that truth in love to your friends, family, and even strangers, I think it's an important one. We'll talk a little bit more that, about that in a second. But, and then speaking blessings over your children. And it's not limited to just parents, but grandchildren, you know, for your grandparents out there speaking blessings over them, and then our spouses as well. Something that um, we also kind of recently went through in married people was blessing each other, blessing our spouses. And I love how they leave time in the married people classes to actually like do it, to go through it together and not just be like, hey, we're going to kind of allow you to take this home and you can work on it at your leisure. There's no leisure. <laughs> there's, there's no like, you can kind of try to carve it out, but when you get home, it's like war zone at times right now with like three kids, five and under, it's, you gotta be agile. And, yeah, so um, I'm glad that they allow that time and that space for us to do this. It was really cool. It was just, uh, you know, it was one of those moments where it's like, okay, now turn to your wife and look her in the eyes. And I realized that I was looking at her beautiful face. I was like, I don't think I've looked in her eyes for more than a couple seconds in the last two days. We're just so busy. And it was really nice to be able to do that. And so the blessing that um, I prayed over her, just in a, as an example, was, Lauren, I call your spirit forward to bless you with knowledge of your purpose. 
Spirit, your Father has a purpose for you. I bless you with being everything God designed you to be. As you fulfill your purpose, you will benefit. Others will benefit, and the world will be blessed. I bless you with knowing the things your Father has called you to know and doing the things he has called you to do. I bless you with being able to carry out God's work with honor, peace, and joy. I bless you with not wasting time or effort doing things God has not called you to do. I celebrate the beauty God has nurtured in you. And I bless you in the name of your creator, God. I bless you, and I love you. So that was just really a cool moment. Um, If anyone is interested in getting into that group, I highly recommend it, and you can talk to me after. But I'd like to see if we, as the home church, can really work together to glorify God like never before with our words in 2019. But that means holding each other accountable and not fearing or staying away from even conflict. Who here likes conflict? Who, well, that's weird. Who here is okay with conflict? I don't know if many people really like it. Maybe Ronnie, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> is anyone okay with conflict in here? I mean, I've seen, yeah, not many. Usually it's like hand down on that one. Um, but it's a, it's a part of life, and we have to know how to move through that in love. I think we all, we definitely, this church has really um, made an impact on me uh, on the amount of people here that are just driven and excited about not only what's going on in the church, but really truly want to grow and be more like Christ. It's fantastic to see that. You know, everyone sitting here is really wanting more of God, wanting to have Christ reside in them. It's not a social club. It's not an entertainment type thing. It's real. Um, and one of our core values uh, as a staff here at the home church is that kindness is a basic characteristic of a mature walk with Christ. But kindness isn't always easy, is it? Um, At least I think it's kind of differentiated from just being nice in a way. It requires courage, it requires that speaking the truth in love. An awareness that maybe too much truth without not enough love can come off as kind of harsh and hurt relationship and leave scars, whereas too much love without enough truth can kind of be a little too soft and possibly um, allow our brothers and sisters in Christ to continue in a bad cycle of behavior or lifestyle. So kindness requires going beyond that politeness, beyond nice to something greater, because that is really what love requires of us. So we're coming to a close soon this morning, and uh, I guess I just wanted to end with a reflection on my life Uh, as a man after God's own heart, but really with a whole lot to learn still about loving God and becoming more like Christ. But I have found, as I was reflecting on this, the pathway to my personal and especially spiritual growth has almost always been through tension, uh, through discomfort, through getting out of my comfort zone, uh, oftentimes pain. Um, and I think that's important to note. So as a, as a final encouraging word, if it does, you know, if doing some of these things maybe feels uncomfortable, if it feels awkward or difficult, you might be on the right path. And I would encourage you to keep going. That, the Christian walk that we're all on, um, you know, if you asked me 10, 15 years ago, I would think it was much more of just kind of a statement of beliefs and Everything else is just kind of a bonus, maybe, or something. But I'm finding more and more that the Christian process, that the walk is really a process of being constantly transformed and molded into Christ, into the image of Christ. And there's really no cheat code or shortcut. It really is about that journey. Uh, And the secret that I'm kind of becoming, I guess, more um, aware of is to try and enjoy those moments of transition, those moments of tension, those moments of uncertainty, knowing that at that moment you are growing and becoming more and more like Christ. Learning to kind of love the presence of God in every moment. So um, I'm going to close now and I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you guys, but um, I just want to say, you know, 2018 has been an amazing year with you, you all. Um, I'm looking forward to 2019. I love you all tremendously and I'm going to pray a quick little blessing over us before Robbie and Bria come back up for worship. Thank you so much. Lord, you are good. 
thank you for everything you've done for us in this last year, Jesus. I pray that you would bring this congregation more and more into an awareness of the power of their words and give them the courage to speak that truth in love that you were able to do so effortlessly and so fluidly, Lord. We need to learn that from you. And uh, we just thank you for every good and wonderful gift that you've given us this year. It's been a hard year for others um, in a lot of ways. Um, we know of sicknesses going on in the church and different things where I just, I, I pray for your presence to be among those people. For you to be, for it to be evidently clear um, that you are right there next to them, Lord. And that you are holding their hand through everything. We just pray for a wonderful 2019 that we are, we are just excited about what you're doing in the church here and the growth that we see. And we thank you for your presence. Uh, we thank you for your spirit in this room right now, Lord. Give us the strength to speak that truth and love in this week and to experiment with those power with that power that you give us through our spoken word. We thank you and we love you in your name. Amen.